All right, well, I guess we'll get started. Welcome. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist here at the Center for Biological Diversity in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. My pronouns are she, her, and I am joining this webinar tonight from Shawnee Territory. Um, thank you for joining us for our speaker series webinars to learn more about the many ways we're working to end extinction. We have a special program tonight organized by our Population and Sustainability Program about women's empowerment and wildlife conservation. So first we'll have a conversation with our panelists and then we'll open it up to your questions. Tomorrow we'll post a video of this webinar and then we'll add closed captions and Spanish translations. So recent assessments by the International Union for Conservation of Nature show that elephants in Africa are even closer to extinction than previously thought. Savanna elephants have declined by more than 50% in 75 years, and forest elephants have declined by more than 80% in less than a century. They're both threatened by ivory poaching and habitat loss. I'm excited for you to meet our panelists tonight. Um, one of them is having, she actually just lost power and is trying to get a generator. Oh, she's here. Sarah's here. All right. So we have Larissa Souza. She is the Associate Director for Gorongosa Parks Communications Department. We have Sara Inez Lara, who's joining us from Colombia, who just got her power back. Oh, we're so happy you made it. And we have Kelly Dinnings from the Center's Population and Sustainability Team. So I'm gonna hand it over to them to tell you a little bit about themselves. Hello, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Larissa Souza. I am talking from the park, actually, <laughs> from Gorongosa. So hello from Gorongosa. I am 30 years old. Uh, I have been working for the park for the past uh, five years, uh, specifically for girls' education and women empowerment. Um, but I was trained as um, a business uh, in business management. Um, but I've been involved in education and um activism and women empowerment for the past um nine to ten years and i'm very very excited to be a part of this amazing project which is gorongosa uh, project and yeah and i'm happy to be a part of 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 the future which is uh, environment and uh, and um uh, science and research and just in general to to save mother earth Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Lara. I'm very sorry about the background noise. Uh, we got the generator going and also the internet router working with the batteries. It's been a big challenge, but it's, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for inviting me. I am the founder of Women for Conservation and very proud to advocate for women in conservation and very big fan of family planning incorporating in every conservation process. Thank you. All right, well, hello, it's great to be with you. I wanna thank Tiara for bringing us all together for this discussion. And I'm really excited to be here with my fellow panelists that have these same overlapping interests as me, you know, reproductive rights, empowerment and conservation. There's not a lot of us out there, but it's great to be with you. So my name's Kelly and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I've been with the center for about two years now. And most of my career was spent actually in waste and recycling. And about five years ago, I saw that that just wasn't cutting it. It was problematic alone. And so, um, you know, we needed to also be decreasing our production and consumption of stuff. So I started to look at a career change and I became interested in working at this intersection of health and the environment. And so I went back to school for a master's in public health. And I had a real personal interest in family planning just based on my experience. And so I became a certified family planning counselor and I couldn't be more proud and excited to be at the center working on these topics that intersect, always intersected in my mind. And I finally found a home where they, they seem to also connect for others within the center. So 
I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. I was re-watching the movie, and once again, I was struck by all the wonderful empowerment stories that were throughout the documentary. And really the thinking that conservation must involve people too. I think that was, I pulled that directly from the movie. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm really excited and, and I'm so glad to be here with everybody. We thought we'd start um, today's event with a little poll. So Griselda, I think she's gonna show us the poll right now. All right. So what's the first thing that comes to mind when we say women's empowerment? Would that be attain reproductive freedom? Is it access to education or staying in school? Is it occupying leadership positions? Or maybe it's financial self-sufficiency, equal pay for equal work, or living in a safe and healthy environment and community. So unfortunately, I forced you to pick one. Um, and this is, again, what's the first thing that comes to mind? So. We will give it another 10 seconds or so. Griselda, I'll take a cue from you when you think we should close the poll. And just a sneak peek, we're gonna have a second poll later. So we'll curious to see how things go. All right, and ooh, the results are pretty somewhat equal here. So I don't know if everybody else can see this, but 13% said attain reproductive freedom, 27% said access to education, 12% said occupying leadership positions. The top here is 32% with uh, financial self-sufficiency and then 16% in a living in a safe and healthy community. So. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, now I'm going to um, also ask for some help from Griselda. For, so for those of you that didn't get to watch the documentary or need just a little memory jog, we wanted to take a couple of minutes to show the trailer before we start our panel discussion. So over to you, Griselda, to play the trailer. Para que o Parque Nacional da Gorongosa e qualquer uma outra área de conservação, principalmente em África, sobreviva, é necessário que tenhamos uma nova visão. Desde o início, percebemos que ele só poderia ser bem sucedido se incluísse as pessoas que moram perto do parque. Em Moçambique, a pobreza tem sempre, sempre a cara de uma mulher. É por isso que o nosso foco está nelas. Quando isso acontecer, as comunidades como um todo serão beneficiadas. As mulheres precisam de ser empoderadas, autónomas. Mas tudo começa com a educação. É importante não desistir, continuar. Temos que lembrar que é importante estudar. Temos esperança e acreditamos que educando as raparigas transformará as nossas comunidades e elevará a todos, mulheres e homens. Aquela aí? Tudo está interligado. Coexistência é uma palavra bonita. É simples de dizer, mas não é simples de criar, não é simples de fazer. That was so, I, um, I love this documentary. It was so like moving and inspiring and I learned so much. So 
Let's start the discussion with Larissa. You're there right now. It's the middle of the night. Thank you for joining us in the middle of the night. Let's just um, tell us more about the park and about your work there. Um, yeah, it's 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 as Dominique was saying in 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 the film. It's um, trying to put everything together, and it's about coexistence, which is a, a very beautiful word, and uh, but something very difficult to do. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so our our main goal is to to strengthen the biodiversity. So joining the 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 fauna and the flora as well as with the people who live around the park. And um, this was mainly inspired by uh, Nelson Mandela's um, uh, point of view, which says that parks and reserves have to cater for the needs of the, the people who live around um, um, these places. And um, it's by doing this uh, human development that we are realizing uh, how important it is uh, to make sure that um, uh, everything else works, uh, that the wildlife is thriving, that the people that live around uh, the park are thriving, uh, that we will ensure that uh, this coexistence um, actually happens. Uh, so the park is um, a very integrated um, um, project where we have six uh, big departments that are working together to make sure that all the areas are tackled and that makes sure that um, uh, we are, are um, doing conservation in general. And so the, the main departments that I was uh, talking about is um, first and foremost conservation, which we have the rangers, so the people who, who uh, are also highlighted very well in the film. And we are very proud to have women rangers uh, because this way we are also showing the community that uh, women can do anything and they are able to do anything uh, in such a, a male uh, dominated area. Um, and then we have the science department, which is focused on research, which is focused uh, on, on uh, biodiversity. Um, and then we have the human development and the sustainable development uh, department, which are focused directly on the people. So we are making sure that these people um, uh, are catered for, that their basic needs are catered for, because we are in a very, very rural area. And uh, most of these places uh, are living under the poverty line. So all we're doing is we're working together with all the services and the ministries of, of, of the government of Mozambique to ensure that these uh, needs are catered for and that they are not doing illegal activities in the park uh, because they don't have alternatives. So we're working to make sure that we are empowering specifically or specifically especially women, to, to make sure that these things uh, are, are moving forward. Um, and then we have the operations and communications department, which are uh, the support uh, for, for all of these um, other departments. And we are very proud of our media um, and communications uh, department, which are able to make films and documentaries like this to show the world uh, what a great example it is and how uh, other places can also do something similar uh, and uh, to make sure that we are uh, doing conservation and, and uh, creating space for future generations where we have the, the, the people living around these, uh, these conservation areas, uh, which will become uh, the stewardess, which will become the activists uh, and making sure that there is sustainability in all our activities. I love it. And I love that you could join us and I love what you're doing. I could just listen to you talk for a really long time. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to circle back to you, but first I'm going to go over to Kelly. Um, tell us about your work as a population and sustainability campaigner. Sure. Um, so our work at the center is grounded in the belief that every person should have the right to choose if and when they want to have children and how many, and to do so in a safe and healthy environment. So we work to ensure that every individual has the resources, access to contraception, and education to plan their reproductive futures. So my role at the center, oh, I almost feel like we should give it back to Sarah, <laughs> in case we lose her. Um, uh, I'll, 
I'll finish up, or Tierra, do we want to ask Sarah to? Um, sure, we can circle back to you. I'm just so nervous um, we'll lose her again. I know. I am sorry. so sorry. Real quick, tell us about, no, you don't have to be quick. I hope you don't lose your connection again, though, but just tell us about yourself and your work and Women for Conservation. How did it Thank get you. started? Um, well, I'm here in Colombia, in the Sierra Nevada, in Santa Marta, in the heart of, of this amazing mountain range, a mountain and the logistic has been really, really difficult. So I'm sorry again about that. Um, the, it's very similar, like Larissa was saying, the inspiration came about 15 years ago when uh, working conservation, I saw the need to involve women in conservation projects. And uh, it, this was, I think it was overseen as is on other examples. And I really was inspired by amazing people around the world who, who have been empowering women. And I took the initiative to start creating opportunities for women to be involved in conservation. Uh, and also I very quickly was aware that family planning uh, was then incorporated. So we had started to design workshops and bring doctors for health clinics. And it was such a, a wonderful experience to see that the women were craving for that. And it was very welcome back when we started was challenging and now is is has changed completely which is more open and women are I, I would say more relaxed about talking about these issues and helping we have been helping with their empowerment so it's a, a wonder, wonderful experience and we all the work that we're doing in Colombia uh, is a country with uh, high biodiversity is it has the number one species of birds in the world. And at the same time, there is a lot of work to be done. And by incorporating women in many, many of the projects, it's been a very a rewarding experience as a woman and seeking for, for opportunities. So this is the work that we've been doing. Uh, it's across, it started in three locations and now is in several uh, areas, conservation areas, who are the yeah. Sarah is frozen. Um, sorry about all the tech issues we're having. It's amazing that she was able to pull it off to join us. So. Um, I guess we'll go back to her when she unfreezes. Meanwhile, we'll kick it back over to Kelly. Kelly, did you want to say anything more about your work? Yeah, just consider me the intermission between Sarah's um, internet connectivity. Um, so, so my role at the center is to develop and execute projects focused on rights-based solutions from voluntary family planning to the solidarity economy to address how the effects of population pressure and inequitable consumption impact our environment. You know, we understand that every child born in the United States has an outsized impact on the planet, and we work to address both topics through gender empowerment, along with individual consumer choices and stopping systemic resource extraction and production. We know that many environmental groups do not discuss population for a variety of reasons, one of which is immigration, However, the center believes since population consumption and resource extraction are global issues, they transcend national borders and US immigration policies should recognize that immigration is a human right and should be rooted in human dignity. Um, and then just to, to close here, you know, we, we really understand it is a complex topic that shouldn't be simplified because communities have been and are being violated through reproductive oppression. So, we want to support reproductive rights and justice allies for long-term holistic solutions that incorporate access to education, health care, voluntary family planning, health and safety environment, uh, health and safe, safe and healthy environments, and gender equality for everyone. So thank you. Good to have you back, Sarah. Thanks, Kelly. Um... So Larissa, I was just so inspired by all of the amazing women in, in the documentary from Antonia, who the ranger to Julia and Gloria that coordinate the girls club 
Um, can you just tell us more about your work keeping girls in school and decreasing child marriages? Sure. Um, so the idea of, of actually doing the, the girls clubs um, was basically because of early marriages that uh, has been happening, um, I think, across Africa, specifically uh, in rural areas. And um, Gorongos is no different from that. And because we want to stop the cycle uh, from happening and the best ways of doing this and woman empowerment is through training and education. And so we decided to, to, to have the girls clubs and um, I was very lucky to be invited to be one of the first um, girls clubs program manager. And so I saw, I saw this start from the beginning and it's, it's very um inspiring and nice for me to see uh, all these girls now grown up and uh, continue with education. So what, what we've been doing is um, to make sure that these girls, which have started, uh, have become role models so that we can now go back into the communities and say that we have uh, real life um, uh, uh, examples. Because one of the, the most difficult things to do is to uh, raise awareness and go to the communities and tell the parents that um, early marriages is a bad practice, it's illegal, and it, it's, it's, it's really bad for the girls. And uh, it cuts all of their future opportunities and it just creates this poverty cycle. And so now uh, we, are, we are very happy to be able to have uh, women like Antonia, which is the fiscal in the documentary, and uh, to show the community that it's possible. And uh, because it's a long-term process, uh, education, uh, we, we are so happy to, 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 to see girls like Isabel, who is today in grade nine, and she's continuing with her education. She's doing uh, her high school and uh, she's thriving. All of these, these girls in the beginning, they, they, they were so shy, uh, they wouldn't talk. And one of the criteria for the girls to, to be part of the girls clubs is that they are um, registered in an official school, of course, because girls clubs is an extracurriculum activity and that they are active, that they are, are, are not shy because these are, are the most vulnerable uh, of the, these communities. So they are normally the ones that are at the back of the class that the teacher is not paying attention to them. And one of the things that happens here is we have uh, very big classes where you have it, one teacher who's teaching a class of 50 or 60 kids so you obviously have uh, have these um, girls who are not being paid attention to. So in the girls clubs, uh, the idea is to create a safe space where the girls can talk about anything and everything, um, that they can share experiences, they can uh, stop being shy, that they are helped by the promoters uh, to do homework, that they are getting the attention that they're supposed to get uh, in school and that they can also participate actively in, in, in their classes. So it's just um, uplifting them and making sure that they have the same opportunity as the boys uh, in terms of, of education. And, and we are very proud um, to have this integrated program as I explained, because we have the health sector, which uh, we have women who are talking about uh, the sexual reproductive health. Uh, we have people from conservation who are coming and telling them uh, what they should do, how they can do waste management, what they should do to recycle. So it's just uh, different activities that they are, are, are able to get uh, within this group. And um, the idea is not to, to, to segregate or push away the boys, but it's just to try and uplift the girls to be somehow at the same level with the boys. And uh, we, have, we do have other um, uh, clubs, other extracurriculum activities where the boys are involved. Um, because at the end of the day, it's no good for us to just be focusing on girls and empowering girls, and we're not talking about the same things within a, a safe circle with the boys. And so um, uh, the girls club is just to, to have this uh, somehow balance uh, within the, the community. And we also work with uh, the older women by empowering them, making sure that they have different uh, livelihood, that they have skills, we train them, we, we, we talk to them, 
uh, at the end of the day, is, is, is a matter of giving a voice to these women who uh, haven't had a voice for such a long time. So it's, it's just a, a, a really good space and um, making sure that women are somehow in, in the same uh, um, space with men and that we are making sure that they know that they can do anything that they, they want to do. I love it. You're doing such amazing work. Thank um, you. Thank you. Sarah, I can't tell. I, I, your video wasn't working. Is your audio working? There she is. Sarah, yes, can you tell us, tell us more about your work empowering women in Colombia? Well, it's so wonderful to hear from Larissa and obviously is, is an inspiration to us. We are very much replicating from another continent what they are doing. Um, here in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in El Dorado Nature Reserve, we are working with three different groups from three different buff areas in the reserve. Uh, these communities are uh, depending on their small farmers. And uh, now ecotourism has become a very, a major player in the area. So with the women, what are we doing in terms of providing training for sustainable liver, uh, livelihoods is providing training on nature, um, bird watching, ecology, to explore that as a, as a career opportunity. Uh, they have been very interested. Many of them are converting their houses or small farms into small lodges. Also, we are training them to, to do uh, cooking, to prepare the food for the visitors, customer service, host, uh, so they can provide the whole um, uh, service to them. Also, we are helping with English classes, uh, to the ladies, but also the whole family is welcome to attend. What we've been seeing is uh, the whole family is keen to obtain this knowledge. For us, that is a big plus because at the end of the day, what we are seeking is that the nature reserve uh, is expanding and that we are forming corridors with the locals. So it, it fortifies and strengthens the, protect, the protected area. Also, because we are every month, more or less every month now, we are helping with the partner in Colombia who is specialized in family planning, which is called Pro Familia. They are the experts in the subject and we have an amazing partnership with them and they provide all the medical service, the psychologist, uh, the health specialist. So with the women, and they are leading the initiative, which is wonderful because is they had embraced it so deeply that they're running with it. Uh, every month we have about 20 to 25 ladies who want to have access to family planning and um, they are driven by it. And now what is happening is more communities are hearing about the success and how wonderful it is for the ladies to be involved in this program. They are requesting to expand it to a bigger area. And this is a very successful story, combining nature, ecotourism, um, sustainable livelihoods, and getting the ladies uh, involved is providing a change, a complete change in the dynamics in this area. That is super important for conservation. It's a key biodiversity area and a hot, hot spot for many species. Thank you. Thank you. That is wonderful um, to learn more about. So I'm gonna kick it over to Kelly we always want to include information on how our members can help. So how can our members help advocate for women's empowerment here in the US and globally? Yeah, so I just wanna start by kind of giving a few statistics about women's empowerment here in the United States. Well, we are, um, you know, maybe further along than, than others on the call, you know, we, we still have room to grow towards gender equality and inequality continues to persist in 
uh, politics, education, jobs, and household labor. So in 2020, the World Economic Forum ranked the United States 53rd in terms of, ge in terms of gender equality out of 153 countries. Um, and COVID exposed this disparity in the workplace and with caregiving, right? So 60% of jobs eliminated in the first wave of layoffs were held by women. You know, female workforce participation is now at the lowest since 1986, and women are losing more pay and career development opportunities due to balancing childcare. So um, these inequalities make it harder for women to get employer provided health care or afford coverage under the Affordable Care Act here in the United States. Um, I did want to touch on child marriage just a little bit. So um, this was a, a new group I came to know last year and was pretty stunned by this uh, statistic, but Unchained at Last is a group that tracks child marriage in the United States and nearly 300,000 children wed in the United States from 2000 to 2018. And 60,000 of those marriages occurred at an age or spousal age difference that it could have been considered a sex crime. Um, so I think we'll maybe throw a, a, um, a, a link here in the chat where you could get some more information. But, um, you know, alarming statistics um, that will also get you fired up are from the US Bureau of Justice. So they show that 32,000 pregnancies result from rape each year. And the Black Women's Blueprint found that close to 70% of Black girls surveyed experienced sexual violence before their 18th birthday. 70% of Black girls experienced sexual violence before their 18th birthday in the United States. So, you know, empowerment for women cannot be achieved without access to comprehensive reproductive health care. In relationship to domestic family planning policies um, that support empowerment, there's a lot going on right now. So um, I'll share a few pieces of policy for folks to look at more in depth, and I can see Griselda's putting them in the chat for you. So first is the Title X Family Planning Program. This was created to bridge the gap in care by providing funding for reproductive health services for low-income people. Um, the Biden administration is looking to repair what was done by the Trump administration. There's the equal access to abortion coverage in the Health Insurance Women's Act. Um, this will permanently repeal the Hyde Amendment, which is banning federal funds for abortion care. Um, and then the other one is on the international front, you know, because we do have our international partners here on the call with us. But um, one of Biden's first actions in office was to resent, rescind the global gag rule through executive order. When in effect, this policy cuts off funding to those international NGOs that provide abortion counseling or referrals. And this bipartisan bicameral reintroduction of the Global Health Empowerment and Rights Act will permanently repeal the global gag rule. So we hope that you'll lend your support for this legislation by completing our action alert that I believe we shared in the chat and uh, we'll share in follow up emails. Thanks, Kelly. There's no shortage of actions that need to be taken. Um, Larissa, can you tell us more about what reproductive health care and contraceptive access is like in Mozambique? We saw a little bit in the movie, but can, can you tell us more? Sure. Um, in Mozambique, um, I think um, family planning has been something that has been um, active for quite a long time now. Um, we have a lot of uh, NGOs focusing on that. Um, we have a population of, of about 38 million at the moment, and um, uh, there is a lot of uh, awareness raising. However, um, we have a lot of cultural barriers which um, uh, say that uh, women uh, have to, to, to uh, have as many kids as they can, and um, yeah, specifically especially in, in rural areas, um, women are normally not uh, using uh, family planning, even though there is um, a lot of access. Um, we as Gorongosa National Park, um, under the, the health sector, are, are providing um, a lot of, of contraceptive um, uh, in terms of awareness raising, as well as actually uh, uh, the, the different methods 
And in Mozambique, we, we have the, the main contraceptive types uh, that are normally condoms for both uh, male and female, which are given for free. Uh, and you can get uh, anywhere in institutions and hospitals for free, which is very good. Um, however, the female uh, condom is not used uh, almost <laughs> by no one, but it's there. Uh, the pills, uh, the daily oral pills, uh, they're also given for free. You just have to be registered in a hospital. Um, there's a, a depot, uh, which is the, the, the trimestral injections. We have the, the implants, um, which are normally for three uh, to five years. And then we have the IUD. These are the, the most famous um, contraceptive type methods that we have here. And they're all for free. You can get them uh, in any hospital or even through our mobile brigades, uh, which are provided by the, the, uh, the Ministry of Health. Uh, but as I said, we have a lot of cultural barriers that um, uh, people uh, still don't don't use it and want to have as many kids as possible. Um, and this comes from from way back where it was good to have many kids because all you needed was to have them and they would go and help in the fields. Um, however, now you need to cater for them, make sure that they go to school and uh, that, they, that they, they have clothes and all of these things. But um, uh, it's, it's a change and change takes time. Uh, but what is really good is that it's there, it's available and people know about it. So we, we are working towards that. And the, there's been a, a big change um, in generations before that um, uh, families used to be as big as 10, 20 even, but now we can see a change that is that number is now a half, which is families of five, families of seven kids per family. And we are hoping that the next generation that is coming will be even less. So we, we, we are happy that this change is happening gradually. Thanks, Larissa. Sorry, can I ask you the same question? Can you tell us what it's like in Colombia in terms of reproductive health care and contraceptive access? Hey, thank you. Well, in Colombia, um, the population in Colombia is of over 50 million people, 50 million point three estimated. And my opinion on the this topic is um, there is limited access to family planning. Uh, the, what I would say is in the rural areas is very limited. The lack of education about the, this subject is one of the biggest challenges. So in what our opinion is if we keep talking about it, bring it to, to the table in, especially when we're talking about conservation, the women are getting more receptive, they're very enthusiastic about um, the fact that they can have access to these methods. And it's a, a transformation is, that is happening very quickly compared to some years ago where it was more taboo. The culture was a little bit more macho orientated, but this is changing very, very quickly. And most of the ladies who are involved in the group now, what is happening is the, the, the husband or the partners, they are happy that they are involved in this initiative and they're actually supporting them. When you compare this with not long ago, it was a different scenario. And when we were talking about family planning was adding um, maybe a little bit of violence against women for even considering to, to have to be doing family planning. So in Colombia, uh, the, system, the health system uh, it covers across Colombia is a really, really good system. Uh, it supports the, the people and the rural and in the city, and they also provide family planning access. But in the rural areas, it makes really difficult for them to have access because logistics, transportation is expensive for them to go to, to the doctors and request the medications and get involved in the family planning. So 
the more that we help them to have access with transportation or sometimes with the cost, if it's not covered by the, by the insurance, which is very rare that that can happen, uh, we are helping them tremendously to move towards that. Colombia, I think, is a very in a very good position and a strong position in the healthcare. And if we connect the dots and provide these opportunities for organizations, like I mentioned, Pro Familia, to come to rural areas with a team of doctors who are psychologists, they are specialized in the matter. And we are just the, the facilitators of this process. So we are making a really, really good connections and long lasting impact and a positive impact that is immediately reflect, reflecting in the how, how many kids the women decide to have. Some of them already three kids and or, or more, and they are already involved in the family planning and they made the decision that they don't want to have more children, but they have that option. In the case of young women, we have seen that they really, now that they have the access to the family planning, they are pursuing their education rather than, than uh, become a mother at a very, very young age when they know that they don't have the resources and maybe the possibilities. We're talking about specifically about the rural areas because the city is a very different um, scenario. So for us to be able to to be in this position is, is extremely privileged and we learn every day. We constantly do more workshops, incorporating more um, suggestions from the, the, same, the ladies who are in the group and how we interact with them is in a very personal uh, relationship. We spend time getting to know them and the families. So we create a, a confidence and relationships the way we allowed not only family planning, but other issues that involve women to be, uh, to be talked and shared in a very space environment. Thank you. The work you're doing is amazing. I'm just, I love hearing about all the awesome projects you both have. Larissa, I wondered, are you working with other parks to replicate the model of linking women's empowerment with conservation? Um, yes, we, we actually have what is called um, an administration of conservation areas in Mozambique, which is ANAC, and um, we have 25%, um, if I'm not mistaken, of the whole um, country of Mozambique, um, which is conservation areas. And so we are working with all the other parks and reserves and to make sure that um, they have access to the information uh, of how we are working uh, in Gorongos National Park. And we, we have shared um, with about three, three or four uh, other reserves in Mozambique to replicate, and they are actually replicating um, some of our, our initiatives, um, especially uh, under human development. Um, because this is um, something uh, new um, uh, for Africa in general to, to be doing um, conservation alongside uh, human development. And uh, yeah, we, we're very happy to be able to coordinate with all these other uh, parks and reserves um, and to make sure that they are um, as well working with the communities that live around these areas. That ties directly into a question. I want to um, take some questions people are typing in. So someone asked if you have plans to set up micro lending or business finance training for women in the communities around the park. Um, yes, um, we, I spoke about one of the de departments, which is called sustainable development. And we actually started this year doing um, financial literacy with the women which, which we are working with up in the mountain. Um, and I sent the link uh, for our Gorongosa, which is um, the profit side, the pro-profit pro side that we are doing, uh, where we're working with um, farmers up in the mountain to make coffee uh, and um, other cultures that they can sell to the park, where we then um, 
uh, uh, process and uh, sell coffee, honey and cashew. So uh, within this whole uh, um, cycle, we are working uh, with women and men uh, farmers to do financial literacy and um, uh, other training that will ensure that they, they have a, a whole um, uh, value chain. Yes. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I've got, a, I've got a question for you about COVID and has the pandemic impacted your work in Colombia? COVID has been a very big challenge. Uh, the impact is, as you know, and everywhere in the world is being devastating. Um, at the same time, has, has been an opportunity for us to realize how important it is to have these relationships at the in the community and support each other. Uh, Women for Conservation was able to raise funds to support families around the El Dorado Nature Reserve, but also in eight other nature reserves in Colombia. We, we were there together and because we formed this, this bond, allow us to come to their homes and, and look for, for other ways that we could um, overcome this situation. Um, it was incredible to see that women were disappointed that, that perhaps they they were considered, some women were considered to do family planning and there was a little bit perhaps of procrastinating or, or no seeking or taking that opportunity just before the COVID started. And some of them were a little bit upset with themselves thinking that uh, having COVID, with COVID was going to be a, a big ch chance of getting pregnant and regretting not doing it sooner. But um, we continue to work. Uh, we had the partners on the ground with Fundacion Pro Aves and their staff. So we were able to reach, reach out to the very, very remote places, bring food supplies to them. Uh, we also invested in providing um, uh, chickens or uh, for them to grow their own vegetables and small there's more vegetable patches so we deliver seeds, materials to, to the women. So during COVID, they were all busy looking at how they could be more so self-sufficient and improve what they already have in, in the rural areas. So it was a difficult experience, but at the same time, we understand that we need nature. Everyone understood how important nature is and how valuable it is to have relationships and that where we can trust each other and help each other, especially as, especially as women. And obviously we had the support of many, many wonderful men who are huge advocates for women empowerment. So with both and with their help, we managed to, to, you know, to, uh, to get better. And, COVID, I, I'm thinking that this year is also is, is, is going to take time, but hopefully next year it will, it will get better with the vaccine and with making it more accessible. Unfortunately, here in Colombia, uh, the vaccine will take longer and, and it's, it's going to be a tough year, but hopefully next year will, will be better. Meanwhile, we will continue to support them, uh, internet and WhatsApp or another uh, mechanisms have been making uh, a good, great impact in, this, in these families because they is accessible now. So we are able to communicate with them and make sure that uh, the network of women continue to grow. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Larissa, there's another question for you. Have you seen husbands object to the use of the many forms of family planning and how does your organization work to overcome that? Um, yes, <laughs> that's normally the case that the women do want to use uh, family planning um, and they, they are now more willing to say that uh, no, instead of having five kids, we can have three and cater and take care of these kids. Uh, the best way we can, but the men are the ones who are normally refusing to, to use any form of family planning. Um, uh, family planning is optional. We, we cannot force people to do it. And uh, what we try to do is to involve um, the couple 
or the, the, the make sure that they are together when we do the awareness raising, when we go and, and, and talk about um, all of these things. Um, normally what happens is if the, the, the wife refuses um, uh, to have more kids, for example, starts using um, behind the, the husband's back, he goes and finds another wife and he starts having more kids. So um, that's not a solution. So what we do is try to make sure that we involve more men. And we have actually um, just started a, a program, an initiative, which is called uh, Men for Equality which these things are, are, are put on the table and discussed. And uh, um, it's men <laughs> talking about uh, um, uh, things like family planning and how they are seen in society and how uh, uh, um, male and female roles can be changed and, and how everyone is made in the same way. We, at the end of the day, we're all uh, humankind and um, that we, we need to start switching uh, sides and making sure that uh, the men are now uh, are the ones who are, are, are being uh, pro uh, women and uh, the ones that are encouraging and valuing women's education and empowerment. And so I think um, that's how we are trying to overcome by creating a program such as this one where the, the men have a safe space, uh, because normally they, they want to just be the macho and uh, being the decision makers, the sole decision makers. And so uh, the idea is to, to make sure that uh, these men are, are uh, uh, being informed uh, first and foremost, and uh, that they are able to understand and start reasoning things because uh, this is something that have come from long, long time ago and it's culture. And so uh, they need to be able to now uh, sit, reflect, understand and reason things. So um, we are hoping that this will help and that they will, uh, as a family, as a couple, would decide uh, to use uh, contraceptive and family planning. Thank you. Um, let's do the second poll that Kelly mentioned earlier. Griselda, could you put up the poll for us? It kind of reflects back to the first one. So what do you think is the most important factor to improve women's empowerment globally? And all of the above, unfortunately, isn't an option. Kelly's making us choose the most important factor. So attain reproductive freedom, access to education and staying in school, occupying leadership positions, financial self-sufficiency, achieve equal pay for equal work, or living in a safe and healthy community. Um, so we'll give you a minute to do the poll and then Griselda will put the results up for us. We don't get to vote. the most important factor to improve women's empowerment globally. All of these things are obviously really important. And we've learned tonight how our awesome panelists are working on all of these things. Chris Hudley, you can close it out and put up the results whenever you're ready. All right. Oh, wow. This one has way more decisive than the first one. So coming in by a landslide is 61% is access to education and staying in school is the most important factor to improve women's empowerment globally. Um, all of those are good. So we have five minutes left. Kelly, um, do you wanna just talk about the situation in the United States in terms of access to healthcare and the intersection of like population and the climate crisis and all of the all of the things that you wanted to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> there's no way I can do that. No. Let me just say that in relationship to access to family planning in the United States, there are still um, plenty of folks that need access here. And and the what was clicking for me was everyone was saying the rural communities. And the same is true in the United States. You know, we need to get, I, what do they call it, the last mile, you know, like we need to really try to get to these communities that, that have less access and they're generally in rural areas. Um, there is a lot of work being done. I was surprised to hear Larissa say, family planning is free there. We don't, we're not there yet. So we have plenty of, of um, opportunity to continue and improve here in the United States. So 
I'll stop there, but I was taking notes when Larissa was speaking and I was like, what we need to learn from them. Um, I'll just mention about how it relates to climate change here because I know you asked me about that one too. Um, but I, it, it's like coming at it from all different directions for climate change. I think, you know, women and gender empowerment is part of the discussion today and women are disproportionately impact when it comes to climate change. There's so much data that shows that. So that would be first, first and foremost. The second one is there's a great group project drawdown that shows actually education of women and girls and access to family planning are two of the top 10 climate change solutions. So while we're disproportionately impact, we are also hold some of the power um, to um, solving, solving climate change. And so I was really excited to see in that poll that education came to the top, you know, because it really is, it is this universal thing that we can do that, um, that, that improves all things. It's one of those that floats all boats, you know, I'll stop there. It's, it's the base. <laughs> I was also very, very happy to see that. It's the base that we all need to, to, to go up. <laughs> so real quick, um, someone has a specific question for you. And if you guys are working on finding, I shouldn't have said you guys, I apologize for that. Um, if you all are working on setting up financial literacy or, or business training, they mentioned an organization called Promo Hair. Can you repeat the question again? Sorry, I lost you for a second. Oh, sorry about that. Um, someone asked if, if as part of your programs, you're working to set up financial literacy or business training for women? Yes, yes, we are. It definitely is one of the things that we are focusing on. The micro, micro loans uh, and also financial literacy is being one of the things that the women really need and they're very happy to to do as a core component of all the training that we are giving in different aspects so we are doing it it's small we're starting small we have uh, but we are doing it and what we are seeking is to partner with organizations who specialize in that in that issue to advise us and to coach us in what it will be the best model to utilize since we have, we are, at, we want to be the most efficient and effective as possible. So for us creating key partnerships with these type of organizations are crucial. Thank thanks, you. Sarah. And we, uh, we have less than a minute left. So I just want to thank Larissa and Sarah and Kelly for being with us today and Sarah and Griselda behind the scenes. And thank you to you at home for joining us. If you haven't seen the film yet, we're gonna add a link to the chat. You can still watch it. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it yet, do watch it. Um, let's see, check your email. Later this summer, we're gonna have another film screening called 8 Billion Angels, and then we'll do a webinar about that. And when we close the webinar, a survey is gonna pop up on your screen. So please take a minute to complete it because we wanna hear your thoughts. And as an incentive, we have a coffee table book that we're gonna give to the winner is called overdevelopment, overpopulation, overshoot. So do the survey when it pops up. And as always, we're so grateful for your support and our and helping us end extinction and save life on earth. We couldn't do it without you. And we appreciate your time this evening. So thank you and thank you all so much. <laughs>